Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Ryerson Home Economics Association's second event of the fall semester. Uh, of course, if you're watching this video, this is our um, Ask Me Anything event with Lloyd Sudeiko from the uh, Chef School of George Brown College. He is a um, program coordinator for the nutrition management program there. And we are very excited to have him uh, join us this evening for um, this event. Uh, I'm going to first introduce myself. My name is Nathan Reed. I am the events uh, director of the Ryerson Home Economics Association, also known as RIA. And I'll be mediating this event for everyone who's in attendance. Uh, so to begin this event, uh, George, uh, Lloyd, I would like to kind of give you the opportunity to introduce yourself to everyone who's here, and we'll go from there. Thank you, Nathan. Um, I'm Lloyd Sudeiko, the program coordinator for the Food and Nutrition Management Program at George Brown. Uh, the program's been around for 34 years at this time. The um, program was originally developed as a post-diploma program to meet the needs of the healthcare industry, primarily as the uh, role of the supervisor and or manager working in hospital long-term care and residential care. Um, one of the benefits or the strengths of the program is that uh, most of our intake is coming from the uh, Center for Colony Hospitality and Culinary Arts, where our graduates have a very strong culinary background that they can go in on a twist of a dime that, you know, if the, super, if the cook doesn't show up or an aide doesn't show up, that they can go in and participate and work with the staff and say, do a breakfast or, or deliver meals to the residents or the patients. So the program being 34 years uh, running, it's the longest program in Canada that's accredited by the Canadian Society of Nutrition Management. So CSNM is the governing body in Canada. Uh, there are nine programs across Canada that are accredited. Um, I'm always happy to see that, you know, when our students graduate and through my network or as past president of the association, that people call and say, hey, I've got one of your students and would like to hire them, give me a reference. And the nice thing about working in the industry and now as coordinator for the, the program at the college is that when I meet or one of my colleagues calls me up and says, hey, Lloyd, um, I got one of, your, one of your students in the program that's looking to apply for a job in Vancouver, gives me the name. We spend 15 to 20 minutes to do more of an off the cuff unofficial interview. And then we spend the next 20, 40, 50 minutes talking about what are they doing? What am I doing? So keeping up with the networking. But networking is so important, so important for jobs within the industry, for getting support and resources within the industry. Right now, you know, we're all challenged. We're challenged with, you know, education and trying to deliver a really good quality program to our students. We're challenged in the industry of, you know, having staff to perform the necessary functions of a kitchen from cooking to cleaning to delivering good quality meals to the residents and, you know, seeing the smiles on their face when they're, um, when they do get those meals or get those selections. I think COVID-19 for all of us in March threw us for a loop, uh, made us really wake up and, and so to say, smell the flowers and realize, you know, thank goodness that we live in Canada. Thank goodness that we have the family and friends and support to help us in, in various times. But what we found in healthcare is, and taking it from a long-term care perspective is, we saw very quickly that management or managers were jumping ship because they didn't want to face the necessary evils or the necessary challenges of COVID, of providing the support for the staff, support to the residents. So, you know, one of my colleagues that works for a contracted services company has 27 homes in Ontario, had one of his, three of his homes within a matter of days, managers leave. And I really believe that, you know, anybody coming into this field, whether you are as, um, coming from the Ryerson program or Brescia or Guelph, or even coming from the program here at George Brown, Humber or Centennial for that matter, when you enroll, there's an empathy, there's a passion in your heart to care and to provide support for those people. Support, you know, clinically, what is the proper diet? What is the proper texture modifications or fluid requirements? to provide that, you know, a cup of hot tea to Mrs. Smith in the morning after she's had a rough night of sleeping because of skin sores and, you know, 
somebody waking her up two or three times in the night as a PSW, poking her and prodding her and moving her so that she rotates and um, helps to ease us up. But, you know, when she gets that cup of tea in the morning, the smile on her face and, and the joy that you bring to those residents and caring for those residents is, there's no dollar value to that. So, you know, one of the challenges, you know, when the government announced that, you know, healthcare providers or healthcare staff could only work in one facility or another, this organization lost one third of its staff because, you know, they had to make a decision. Are they gonna stay with this organization or are they gonna to go to the other organization that they work in? I think, you know, what we've heard is it is going to be for the better. We do need the shakeup in the healthcare industry to provide better quality services, to provide the staffing levels that need to be there to provide it. You know, we talk about our dietitians in long-term care getting 30 minutes per resident per month. How do you physically do that, you know, as a dietitian if you have 200 residents? Well, we work closely with the di our dietitians, and, and that's the role between, you know, a dietitian and a food nutrition manager. Dietitians are there to oversee the overall care and well-being of the residents, and our food nutrition managers have, coming out of the program, a good solid base that they could look after the nutritional requirements of a low or moderate risk. And then that way the dietitian can look after the high risk. But in any organization, you have to have solid teamwork between your dietitian and your food nutrition manager. And that's where we say that at George Brown, you know, our students coming out have a really strong culinary background. They have a really strong entry level for clinical nutrition. And, you know, going out into the field, they get two externships. One's a clinical, could be a hospital or long-term care. And then we do another one to give another sense of, you know, which direction of the industry do you want to go? Do you want to go maybe into residential care? Do you want to go into child care? Do you want to even stretch further and go into prison systems or into the military or into the Navy with Canada? So, you know, yeah, we need to send our troops out onto the ships or out into the fields, and they need to have those nutritional support mechanisms mechanisms in there uh, because they're working hard for us and we need to support them. So whether it's even childcare, you know, one of our uh, past graduates is uh, chief food ambassador for Kids and Co. And, and, you know, her biggest thing is that communication is so important. You know, if you are a parent and dropping off your child and it could be your first child at the age of th three or four at daycare, you know, you're worried about who's going to be looking after little Johnny or Sue and, and ensuring that the nutritional needs are being met. And if there's any allergens or awarenesses that have to be had in there. And she, she always says that, you know, her biggest challenge with her managers is that time between, you know, 630 and eight o'clock in the morning where, you know, mom will be sending a text to her and or to that supervisor at that facility and say, oh, please don't give Johnny this. And because my husband's dropping them off, they get dropped off by the husband and they said, oh, well, they would like to have this. So they can contradict between the parents. But what happens is we create new nutritional profiles, whether it's for the children in the daycare centers, whether it's nutritional profiles of, you know, our seniors or not even seniors these days of our individuals coming into long-term care, because somebody at the age of 18, 19 could be in a long-term care facility. And, you know, and they're there because, you know, family or the mechanisms are in place to care for that person at home. So that's where we come in as a compassionate, empathetic person. Uh, staff in these facilities. And, you know, then becomes the other challenge, you know, with the nutritional care plans in long-term residential or hospital is, are we maintaining them? Are we keeping in communication with those residents? And that becomes a vital piece, you know, going into menu planning, into special events and costing of those departments. So, you know, we, we look at all those things and, you know, I say to my students today, or every year in that first week and, and throughout the year now, is you will be looking after me one day. And they go, oh, sir, you're not old enough. I go, well, my, my strategic plan right now is I like to be retired in six years. That's strategic. Health-wise, I could probably work for another 10 to 15. But again, strategic, if I'm my health as well, I would still like to work maybe not full-time, but part-time. 
But again, when my application comes across the desk, and it could be one of my past students, they can say, hmm, here comes Sadeko. Do we want him in our facility? Do we not want him in the facility? If I'm um, Alzheimer's and I'm, or with Alzheimer's or dementia and, and I'm a happy Alzheimer's patient or dementia patient, you know what, I could walk the halls, just give me a cup of tea or something in my hand to eat and I will be happy go lucky Lloyd walking the halls. I could also be the other resident that, you know, is, um, you know, maybe because amb ambulation, I have a walker, or I have a wheelchair, you know, I'm able to sign myself out, go for a walk or wheel myself down the street to, uh, to the park and enjoy the weather. But, you know, in the morning, if I see something or at lunchtime, I see something, I'm gonna observe it and I'm gonna call up the manager in that facility and say, hey, do you think we can have a cup of tea or a cup of coffee or just have a chat? And I'll, I'll be honest, and that's what they need. They need that honesty to ensure that their food service is running smoothly. Not that somebody's coming in into the dining room and the treatment that they're providing to the other residents is unacceptable. Dining should be pleasurable. You go to a restaurant, you want to have, you know, good service, nice atmosphere, clean tables, clean glasses, nicely appointed. And, you know, in Ontario, we do have long-term care facilities that are doing that with really nice china, silver, and you know, really nice linens to go with that to create that atmosphere. But you know, if something's not going right, I will say, hey, Nathan, this is my concern. This is what's happening. Maybe you know your PSWs and your facilities are coming in, and as soon as the fruit basket comes out, which is supposed to be for the residents, you see the PSWs loading up their pockets and walking down the hall to their lunchroom, emptying out their pockets. They've got their fruit for the afternoon or for the evening shift. So again, budgets are tight. I get that. Um, Students, uh, I believe we have two, possibly three students this year that came to us from Ryerson. And as a Ryerson graduate, you come up with, come in with some really good, strong clinical uh, background in there. So doing your transfer credits of say something around um, clinical nutrition or basic physiology or nutrition analysis, you know, there's three credits that, you know, you come into the program that, you know, you'll get those credits for, eases up on your workload. Um, we also say to the students coming in that this is not your normal college program where, you know, you're doing 12, 14 hours a week, um, and it's relatively easy culinary, you're in demos, you're in labs and, 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 and some theory. So, you know, when you're in the labs or the, or the demos, you know, you're observing and then replicating. So that's fairly easy, but students coming from a culinary program or even our baking program, I say to them, it's double the workload. You need to set your priorities, manage your time and you'll do well. Somebody coming in with a B or B plus or higher will do extremely well if, as long as they manage their time and set their priorities. Um, graduates coming from Ryerson's program or Guelph or Brescia, you know, they're coming in with two to three credits uh, lighter of a load. So, you know, there's no reason why they can't move forward quickly and do successfully in the rest of the program around communication and other uh, management skill sets. The only challenge that we have for anybody coming from, you know, Ryerson, Brescia, or, or Guelph, or even international, uh, internationally trained dietetics or with a food and nutrition background is the contact time or the um, kitchen exposure. And that's, we've come up with a plan two years ago that we implemented. It's a work integrated learning. So if anybody doesn't meet the culinary entrance requirements, we will suggest as part of graduation is to take a 44 hour course. There's no additional cost to anybody to do it. We've integrated it into the normal process within the college. We provide you the uh, contact time in a large quantity kitchen. We provide you the lab or the um, outfit, the hair covering, the side towels, and even the use of knives. So you don't even have to go and spend $200 on knives to, you know, to do this course in order to get those skill sets honed up so that yes, you, when you get that first job, you can run that kitchen. You can help the cook make sandwiches or you know, open up the kitchen in the morning, turn on the steam kettle, make that oatmeal, do the poached eggs and get going. So we do that because one, it's, we think it's incumbent that everybody has those skill sets. 
And two, it holds people up from where we previously said that you would have to do a two semester culinary skills. Financially, that's not possible these days. You know, you're spending a lot in a lot of money, time, in resources in your education that you have now. Some individuals coming from, you know, Ryerson, Brescia or Guelph are saying, I don't want to go the route of a dietitian. I want to do that route of the food nutrition manager or the diet technician in a hospital. So you're coming in with some really strong clinical. And we find that, you know, it's really heartening, disheartening when, you know, people apply for their internship to, to become a dietitian. They apply one year, they apply two years, five years later, they finally get turned down again. And they, and, and you hear the horror stories that, you know, I remember where, you know, there were say like in Ontario, you could have had 300 internships for dietitians. Today, what have you got in the city of Toronto? Barely uh, two handfuls. And that's really hard. So where do you get your job? Where do you go? And, you know, my dietitians I work with, Dr. Gillis and uh, Carla Diano, both of them say, you know, you need to have those 90% or better in order to pursue that next level that you want to go through. And it's competitive. But, you know, at the end of the day, you need a job. And that's where I think we at George Brown have met the challenge both domestic and international for students like yourselves that want to get a job. And maybe this is the stepping stone, so to say, to get a job in healthcare, to pursue your clinical internship um, with a company. Um, one case that we had, and this is going back about eight years ago, um, student that came in to us um, was internationally trained um, had been in Canada for four years. She tried to do the route of the upgrading through the Canadian Dietetic Association, found that really challenging in doing that program. Um, really wasn't conducive for her because she had young children, but she still needed a job. So she applied at George Brown and what she had to do, she had to take the two semesters of the culinary skills and then did our two semesters with us. She got out of college um, a full-time job with Morrison under Compass. And, you know, she worked and proved herself very well to the district leadership and the senior leadership in that in the area, in the Toronto area. And she applied to them to do her externship. And they said, we'll grant you that. And grant you that because one, you're a dedicated hard worker. You have demonstrated your skill sets and your dedication to the company, to the residents and to your staff. And so she, she got in, she got her internship and she did it uh, in con conjunction with while still working full time. So she still had her facility of 200 and I think about 20 beds that she was responsible for. She was relieved from that facility for three days a week in which she would go to another facility under a dietitian to complete her internship. And then in her facility, they brought somebody in for another five days. So even though she's still there two days fully responsible, they brought somebody in to the three days to cover her being away, but also another two days. So the facility really was in a win-win situation. So she completed her internship. She got her designation of RD. And within four months, there was a major reshuffle within uh, Morrison and she got a full-time job as a dietitian. So now she's working, she has a set number of homes that she's a dietitian for. And, and it's not dietitian in the home that she's, she's responsible for. She's dietitian over, I think, 10 different homes. So she's more ma district manager dietitian. So she's demonstrated you know, her skill sets, her dedication to the company. On the flip side is she had to commit to still working with them for another three years after graduation and getting her designation. And she had no problems with it because, you know, with that, it gave her opportunity within Compass and Morrison to grow, to have that opportunity to do transfer if she, if she and her husband and family wanted to do a transfer. But it's success stories like that that you see that, you know, somebody, again, whether it's Ryerson or international student coming in, we wanted to close the gap and save some money for students. And that's why we did the Work Integrated Learning Program. It's built into your day-to-day -day programming. Um, and we work with you guys on that. So this year, 
out of a class of 46, I think there's 17 that will be doing the work integrated learning coming up in January. Um, and again, we built it within the system. There's no additional cost and um, you guys win. You win at the end of the day. So I, as I said, you know, there are two externships, one clinical, one administrative. It gives you the best of both worlds where you can go out into the industry, demonstrate who you are and um, start those networks start those networks that you know your dietitian the facility you're in may be there two days a week and two days in another facility and one of the facilities that she's in says we're looking for a part-time supervisor or a manager to replace that's your perfect opportunity demonstrate your skill sets do not sit in the corner and say it's boring i have nothing to do or i have to complete these audits again you know, completing audits or completing those day-to-day -day tasks, there, there's value in those because if we're completing them and being honest about them, reviewing them and saying, okay, this is the trend that's happening. How do we break that trend and make things better for the resident and the staff and the facility? So again, you know, the, the jobs are out there. I think that CSNM has done a phenomenal job over the last uh 10 years, their strategic direction where they just announced their new uh, three-year plan is dynamic. Um, and, you know, as I said, you know, I have sat on the national board for seven years and of those seven years, four years was on senior executive. And it was trying times, trying to, you know, upgrade the standards, bring it up technology, introduce an internet and web-based learning that, you know, we were doing that 15 years ago and here we're doing it full time now with, you know, you're in the classroom, I'm in the classroom. Um, talking to Nathan just before coming online with you is, you know, online learning is not easy. It's not easy for your faculty and it's not easy for the students, but you need to have value in that classroom. Not that, you know, here's an assignment or here's a, a paper or here's a website, go and do this. And then it, what's the value of that? Is there any discussion? Is there inter, any interaction? And I think I was saying to Nathan that, you know, we took the time to rebuild our program and our courses so that they were compliant and met all the CSM standards. And right now I'm running out of time. You know, if I have a two and a half hour class and normally we like to break by say eight to 10, 15 and be ready so that the rate for the next class at 10, 30 is, is a run, is a run. So, you know, I do now office hours twice a week with students where they can go in through Blackboard, drop in and ask questions on an assignment or talk to me about some of their own challenges or send me a, a message and say, hey, can we meet on Teams? And I've got some challenges. So, you know, the, the dynamics of the program, um, are far reaching for all of us. Um, and I think you as graduates coming from the program, it's a good stepping stone for you. Um, you do, we do make arrangements with you to get those two externships. So I make all those arrangements with you. And you know, at the end of the day, you become a member upon graduation. You just need to scan and upload your, your graduation diploma into CSNM and you're automatically a member of CSNM pending paying your membership fees. So one of the nice things about the programs across Canada, we are audited and, and or reviewed for accreditation standards every five years. So ours was done just over three years ago in 2017. And we got the best accreditation review that George Brown has ever had. And still keeping my networking and my connections and knowing the accreditation chair found out that it was one of the best accreditations that they've ever done in all of the sites across Canada. So it's a really good feeling knowing that, you know, you apply to the program, <clears throat> you go through the materials, you do the assessments with us, and there's not another exam to write to become a member. That's graduation is your, your ticket into the society. Um, membership right now, I believe, is at 175 a year. So compared to a dietitian's membership and insurance and everything else that's going on, it's a small amount to pay for a job in the industry that can be very rewarding. And again, you need to det determine your career path. You know, you've done what three, four years at, at Ryerson, and you're coming out with a degree. 
Um, and where is that going to take you? I, I, I do not put anybody down, but it really need you need to think about that because you know until you get that internship, you're holding a piece of paper that's partly valid. You need to get that that RD designation, and that's where I think George Brown can help you in that path. You know, doing the two semesters with us, you get three credits. Um, done as transfer credits, we will work with you on the work integrated learning and, you know, you're coming out and you may have a company, it may be Morrison, it may be Sodexo, it may be Aramark, that you're working in there and you approach them as part of a program that they have internally to do your internship as a dietitian and get that designation. And it's always nice at that point that, you know, one, you're getting paid and somebody's paying you to get your internship at the end of the day. So that's a bit about George Brown. We do have, um, due to COVID, we have really um, s s closed down the facilities um, in that uh, it's a challenge because, you know, we are very hands-on skill-based training at our facilities on 300 Adelaide. So George Brown really quickly took a stand uh, to shut everything down back in March. Like it, and we were the first college in Ontario, Ryerson was the second right behind us within hours when we went into shutdown um, and came back out stronger than we have ever been. You know, we have a dynamic group of faculty of chefs and uh, patisserie chefs and dietitians and, and whatnot on staff that, you know, within two weeks, we were trying to come up with a bigger and better plan of what are we going to do in the May to August semester, or what are we going to be doing for the September intake? So, you know, yeah, those are challenges. And I think we've met those challenges head on. They're a group of dynamic people. They're not going to sit back and say, yeah, we'll go with status quo. But yeah, we have had some challenges around um, completely shutting down. The board very quickly said students were our first concern. We do not want them to be at, put at any potential risk. So, you know, whether it's been our Health Sciences Center, Center for Health Sciences, or our program here, or the PSW or the child care program, I think we're in a better state and a better position to put you guys into industry because we're working with industry that is already under the gun, that, you know, that the PPEs are there, you need to follow this. If you don't have your mask, you don't have your gown, you don't have your gloves on, then you're going to get raked over the coals. So, we're feeling really good about putting our, our students out into placement coming up in, in February. Um, and as the board says, students have to be first and foremost. And if your preceptor or the facility that you're going into is not providing those support mechanisms or PPEs, I need to know because I'll have you out of there so fast and we will be pulling our affiliation agreements and saying, listen, this is what you agreed to and you need to provide that because we want our students to win. Okay. How's that, Nathan? Awesome. Yeah, thank you for so much for sharing all of that. Uh, I'm sure we're all very appreciative. I've had a few questions that you actually answered in all of that, so that's great. Um, so like for myself being a um, undergraduate student at Ryerson, I am pursuing or looking to pursue um, my um, internship in dietics after I graduate from uh, the food and nutrition program. And of course, um, like myself and others here, we all understand the whole gist of um, the program being very competitive in terms of trying to pursue a degree in dietics. So it's great that um, you know, there's George Brown College uh, in the same city who offers programs um, where students can like leave Ryerson with a, a degree and um, use some of their credits there and go into a program at George Brown and probably pursue a different career path in dietics, um, whether it's in food and nutrition management or actually you know, learn some culinary skills to like find a job um, working in a restaurant or whatever it, it may be. Um, so it's definitely great to know that um, there is those opportunities there, which and um, in the time that we're living in now where, you know, jobs are hard to find as it is. Um, it's great that um, the uh, George Brown College is actually um, actively helping their students um, to find jobs, to find externships um, when the time comes from that. So I was definitely a uh, great thing to learn from that. Um, one question I did want to ask, of course, we're living in a time of pandemic. So particularly with some of the programs like the, the pastry programs and, what, and whatnot they have there, 
um, with classes or courses being conducted online or through distance learning, how does that work where like you have to be hands-on in terms of like trying to improve like your culinary skills? So in that, good question, Nathan, and that's where, you know, we had to pivotally change to meet the pressures within the industry. Um, and that's where your uh, pastry chefs and your culinary chefs really pull together quickly. So one is because our labs are traditionally 24 students in a lab, we went to 12 students in a lab. We had to meet uh, physical distancing, uh, space requirements at all times. And we, we kind of laugh now because we do have the COVID police that are walking the halls in our center. Um, and see if the, somebody's not wearing PPEs or somebody's not maintaining the physical distancing, we know that we're under the gun and we will be shut down immediately. And it's not just the class, it'll be the whole division that gets shut down. So, you know, pivoting to that, our faculty really ramped up um, the videotaping of all the skills that are required in, in all the programs, whether it's culinary or whether it's baking and pastry arts. And what we did is, took, if it's a four semester culinary program, we took the first three semesters, actually all four semesters did the videotaping of all the skills. And in the first three semesters, we really strengthened on what the students had to do for demonstrations and doing this and practicing those skills at home. So for example, you know, we may talk and have in part of the ingredients these ingredients and some students would say to us, but I can't get those ingredients. So the faculty have been really good in saying, here's another way to demonstrate that skill, maybe with this vegetable or maybe with this meat or whatever the case may be. So we also took into account that, you know, part of your student fees, a, a percentage goes to food and beverage supplies in order to out, outfit you in the class. So we went through, we reevaluated everything and, and it was a task that we did about five years ago where we really had to cost center what each lab was costing or each course was costing. And thank God we did that about five, six years ago because now we're able to say, you know, turn around and say, refund the students their fees on those labs because you're going out to purchase some things. In some of the programs we've actually done, um, kits and more in the area of the baking program where there are specialty items that you can't get at your normal grocery store or that we can get it in bulk at a, at a much more reasonable cost. And what we did is we packaged things up that the students would come and pick up a box of, of supplies that they would need over the 14 weeks. So, you know, we really have moved around, but what we've done in the last semester, say in the fourth semester, you'll still do your videos and have your requirements of watching them, fulfilling that. There's always a, a three hour a session every week with the students on those videos to you know, encapsulate what did you see and to fine tune and say at this stage of you know, making a hollandaise, you really have to be cautious when you're adding the clarified butter so that it doesn't split or doesn't thicken. And, you know, and they'll talk about things. So there's key points within those skills that they will, do a class session with you still and to hone up on that. So we're only bringing into the school um, four semester students or their last semester of their program that they're actually physically in the classroom, again, physical distancing and actually having to demonstrate. So if you're doing in semester one within the first two weeks, knife skills of to do a julienne, a baton, um, different cuts of, of vegetables and, and whatnot, then, you know, when we bring them into the fourth semester, we will really focus on a lot more stuff in a very short condensed time and say, do you not remember what we did in week three in first semester and we were doing vegetable cuts and that you look at what they're doing and saying that's not acceptable. So the, the real challenge that we had was not the actual students practicing it at home and doing videos or photograph sessions and doing a, a portfolio on each week and, and submitting it, was the actual missing of the aroma, missing the sense of 
tasting that sauce or tasting that dish on your mouth and and you know what were the sensory pieces on that was it sweet was it salty was it sour was it bitter and so that's what we're really missing and the students know that and and that's their biggest concern and the faculty know that but again when we get you into your fourth semester and we started doing that um, in July and August, we did our first trial runs that was when it's successful and we're now in the September to April or September to December session and it's going really well, you know. The challenge is, you know, when you come into the college, you don't just come in half an hour before you come an hour and 10 minutes before because to get through security and COVID clearance testing and getting in there's dedicated areas for changing now. So we've taken some of our classrooms offline because nobody's in the college and we partitioned off, you know, dressing areas for the men and the women that are basically six by six cubicles partitioned off that at least you have the privacy and you can do that safely and securely. So overall health and safety of our students has been paramount. And I think, um, you know, it is a shift. It's, um, and we take a look at other organizations globally, like you take a look at CIA, the Culinary Institute of America, and how much that they put stuff online. Um, and yeah, we're competition with CIA. So, you know, if we take a look at our position in North America, George Brown's number two, CIA, of course, is still number one. And our motto is, you know, we'll cut them down one way or another, or whatever the case may be. So we need to be part of that market and be part of that changing dynamics. And we realize that it's not the best situation. We would rather have all the students in the classroom, but until such time that COVID-19 is looked after either through vaccination or of its demise, um, I think we all need to be aware um, of what is going to be the next pandemic. And I think, you know, if you're at an age where you can remember SARS, um, that was scary. I was working full time in, in a healthcare facility and I was one of those facilities in the outside the GTA area that was associated with a central hospital, which was uh, McKenzie Health that had staff working there and working in our facility and we had to be at the door and say, sorry, stop, you can't come back in. So if you've gone through SARS, that was more of a taste of what was to come. We went through MERS and now, you know, we're sitting with COVID, which is globally putting us all at, at risk and, and putting us to the test. And I think, you know, those that are willing to take on a challenge, being compassionate and empathetic of those residents are, that are in facilities, and they're there, not there because they want to be. They're there because of, you know, long-term care medically or challenge that they can't. Residential, you know, they're there that's their choice. You know, they're paying two, no, not even two, four thousand to eight thousand dollars a month to have a really nice place that she, they're cared for, that there's good quality meals and there's activation. Family can come and visit. Well, family can't come and visit. You look at what's happening in hospitals. You know, food service departments are are basically depleted, and there's no ancillary services. So, you know, if you had a, a Tim Hortons or a Starbucks or a Mr. Sub in your operation, they all got shut down. So, you know, we're all scrambling in, in this. And I think, you know, going through it, and it's going to make you stronger. One of our graduates of uh, not this past year, but the year before, she took six months off and then she came back and did her externship later because she had other prior commitments uh, in her personal life. She completed her externship um, the end of December. She did it for the November, December. The end of December, she finished her externship. And then I had a call from the national director for Morrison give me a call and say to me, hey, Lloyd, we haven't talked in a while. The last time I saw you was in Calgary. And we did, you know, that networking catch up. And uh, the ultimate question was, do you have one or two students that are willing to take on a challenge of a lifetime? And I said, what's the challenge? Well, it was the number one leading facility in Ontario that was in the social media or the news eye because of the number of residents that were infected, um, that were passing. The food service department got decimated because, you know, first it was the cook that 
became positive and then you know half of the staff became positive because you know you're working in a closed environment and the transmission was so high that you know they actually shut down the food service morrison shut down food service and then they said we are going to bring food in on trays and that's what they were doing so they were looking for somebody to take on the role as the acting food and nutrition manager and their primary role was to facilitate and coordinate the receiving of the meals and ensuring that the meals would get to the floors and to the residents. So she was hired. She could name her salary, um, which she did. She wasn't overly uh, greedy about it. So she got herself a nice salary. The facility agreed to pay her for, I think, three weeks after her, her period was done and they came out of COVID-19 and uh, they would pay her while did, she did her self-isolation for the minimum of two weeks. Um, long and short of it, she got a full-time job. She was able to take her skill sets, her leadership qualities, her communication abilities, and demonstrate clearly to the facility that she was the right person. Also from Morrison's perspective and knowing Morrison, Will she be there for the long term? No, she's going to be promoted and work her ways up to, you know, regional manager to more of a district regional manager in, you know, in three to five years. So again, you know, are you willing to take those risks, take those challenges? And I, I get it, you know, it's a scary thing that could affect you, your family, your loved ones, and your children if you have children. Or, you know, from my perspective, my parents are in their late 80s, both diabetics, father has a heart condition, mother early dementia. And, you know, when I go to visit them, they're part of my bubble that um, I'll go and visit for two or three days. My father had heart surgery the second day, the Wednesday after classes started. And so I spent three weeks up there with them on and off and to look after them to do what they needed. But again, you know, that's who we are in this industry, who I am, who you are, there is a passion that's there for you. And you're doing it for a specific reason. So you know, it could be somebody in, in a hospital long term residential care, it could be somebody as part of um, a food share program or um, a community support mechanism or a halfway house uh, a senior living complex. So you know, you're needed. You're not, it's, you're not going to go by the wayside. If we take a look at the global population of where we're going to be by, I think it was by 2050, we're, 2050, we're looking at 60 to 65% of our population is going to be over the age of 60, 65. Who's going to look after me? I want, I, I'm at a stage of my life, I want you to look after me. And so those needs are there. And even if you, if we look at you know, the private services, you know, you can go to some golf and country clubs where they hire a dietitian to do nutritional counseling and, and meal planning and things of that nature, or, you know, maybe a parent talks to the dietitian and says, hey, my child is, you know, I think they're anorexic and, you know, that becomes a whole new dimension and, and that's what's happening and, and changes in the industry. So it's not just your typical long-term care hospital uh, operations that you're in, your ability to overreach and find your sweet little career path, it's all there for you. You just need to find it and, and make it grow. So yeah, thank you for sharing on that as well. Yeah, I feel like with the, the pandemic, it's kind of like a blessing in disguise where it causes industries and people just to kind of think um, about the world and kind of the industry that they're in in a different way. and. Um, to make it more accessible and more um, up to date, I guess, up to standards with yeah. the times that we're in. Yeah. Um, at this time, I'd like to open it up to the students who are here um, to ask any questions to Lloyd that they may have. Um, so if you would like to ask a question, you can unmute your mic and um, go ahead and ask your question. Thanks, Nathan. Hates. You, can also, you can also write your question in the chat and I can ask for you 
if you're more comfortable that way, if you're not one who enjoys speaking on video. Uh, Pranar, I see you have your hand up. You can, uh, you can ask your question. Thank you. Uh, hi, Lloyd. It's Pinar. Hi, Pinar. Uh, I'm studying culinary management. You know, you're a current student. Yes, I do. Yeah. So I was wondering, like, um, which kind of advantage I'm going to have if I follow up that program and if I study that post-graduation program? So, Pinar, you already got your culinary management. You did the culinary management nutrition, I believe. Yes, I'm in my third semester. At Ryerson or George Brown? No, George Brown. I'm studying still. Okay. So, okay. So the, adva the advantage that you have is you're coming in with a strong culinary. Um, one of the things I did not mention, Nathan, is that we, as part of a requirement for the accreditation standards, students need to also have a, a, a basic marketing principles and um, accounting principles. So, you know, Pinar, that's one thing that you're going to be having to take a look at. And if you want to pursue the program for next September, which you'll be nicely aligning yourself for, is I would take a look at if you can put into your programming through Con Ed a marketing or a accounting to ease up on your workload coming up for next September. So, you know, coming through the culinary program, you're coming in with a strong culinary background. You guys uh, from the culinary management nutrition, you know, we, as you know, we take your first semester culinary is similar to that, but then we start to diverge away from the cult classic culinary skills of, you know, culinary uh, skills from a classical French perspective, and we move it more into, you know, you're working on genesis, you're working on food labeling. The difference between culinary management nutrition and the food and nutrition management program is that the food and nutrition management program is an accredited program. We get reviewed every five years to meet the standards. A student coming out of culinary management nutrition would like to apply to CSNM and say, well, I did culinary management nutrition. And the people in the office will call me up and say, do you know so-and-so? Do you know Pinar? I go, yes. And is she eligible? No, she's not. So again, it's the route that you want to take um, if you want to work under the CSNM re requirements. And I, and I maybe I wasn't clear on saying something, but in Ontario, you need to be eligible for membership to work in long-term care. Eligibility stated under the CSNM guidelines is you're eligible to become a member for two years less a day from your graduation. So if you pass that two year period, you need to rewrite an entrance exam in order to qualify for membership again. So that's one challenge. So that's written right into the long-term care regulations. In Ontario, the retired residential care regulations are very minimal, but we have suspicion that if we didn't go into COVID, the regulation of being a member of CSM would have been in implemented probably in the next 12 months. But, you know, we know it's going to happen. It's just now, when is it going to be happening? So that's long-term care. That's residential care. CSNM has also been working very diligently with human resource departments and showing the benefits of having a CSNM member and writing into job postings, job positions, must be eligible for CSNM or must have their membership. So again, you know, this year was a unique year that, you know, we didn't do our final placement. We did something in substitute of that. And students uh, got a letter from us at the college. They were able to apply for their membership right away, got their membership and got a job. So even employers are willing to take a risk and write within your job offers that if you are not currently a member that they'll say, you need to get your membership act, an active membership within 60, 60 days of employment. So this year's graduating class, you know, there's about 11 of them, I think, that got job offers in through the end of April. 
and were starting to work and got statements like that written in, whether it's 30 days, 45 or 60 days. And, you know, within two weeks of, you know, I think May the 7th or May the 8th was our magical date, they were getting their memberships and they were getting those full-time jobs. I think the misconception at the college, and I don't know where this comes from, is that students in your program, Pinar, feel that they're automatically eligible for membership and they're not. If we say that, you know, we have students from Ryerson, Brescia or uh, Guelph coming into the program with a, a degree program on dietetics or, or food sciences, then, you know, they have the backing already from a clinical. They can do those jobs beyond what I could possibly do. My background isn't clinical. My background is culinary and management. So I rely on my dietitian. I have good working relationships with my dietitians. And that's where, you know, you coming into the program, Pinar, strong culinary, so you're not going to have to do the work integrated learning. But what we will sit down and talk about is, is there an accounting or is there a marketing? And in the program culinary management slash nutrition, there's no marketing. If you did culinary management, the traditional route, there is a marketing program or marketing course in there that that becomes one of your courses that you have done already. And I'm not sure, Nathan, but in your program, is there a marketing course or is there an accounting course already built into your courses? Yeah, so for the food and nutrition undergrad program, you do have to take marketing uh, second year. Um, I took it first year because that's my second degree, so I had transfer credits to kind of accelerate uh, my time. But yeah, usually second year, you would take marketing. And then if you do um, plan going down the, the route of going into dietics, um, you do have to take accounting. Um, so it's not required if you're just trying to get your degree in food and nutrition and kind of going to a different, um, different avenue. But if you are going down that route of dietetics, you do need to take um, accounting as well. So you do have uh, both those courses once you graduate. So then that from, from a Ryerson's perspective, that's another plus for students coming from Ryerson into George Brown. You could have your, diet, your uh, marking and you can have your accounting and that becomes two pieces less that you have to worry about. So, you know, your year could be a fairly easy year. The other thing that the program, um, before I say that, Nora, does that answer your question? Yeah, it makes sense. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, the other nice thing about the program that other programs in the college, especially in our division of the Center for or, uh, the Chef School, is we run our program Monday to Friday from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. So the number of hours associated in the program is 25 contact hours, where most college programs you know, are about 14 hours on average, 14 to 16 hours. So we really ramp up on the contact time in the classroom and, and the amount of work that's being delivered or content that's being delivered. But what the nice thing about that is if you're doing like an eight to one courses, you got two courses a day, eight to 10.30 and 10.30 to one. When you're finished at one, that gives you some good solid time to work in groups or do your studies and then be able to function somewhat normally in the evening times around family or if you have a part-time job. Whereas most programs, whether it's George Brown or it's Ryerson, you, you get a schedule and, and you look at what you what's there and when that course is, no, I don't want to take it it's at that time. I'll take this one. No, I don't like that one at that time because I don't like the teacher. Um, but with us, you know, it's guaranteed Monday to Friday, eight to one, you know exactly where you need to be. And I, I know from our perspective in doing online, you know what, systems come up 15 minutes before class starts. I'm there 10 minutes before. It's hi, how are you? You have your idle chit chat or, or, or questions and answers, which is really positive. And then like eight o'clock, I give it to 802. I'm off to the races and I don't stop until uh, 10, 15, I'll give you a 10 minute break in there for, you know, do a bladder break and grab your water or grab another cup of coffee and get going. But again, the benefits are you're there eight to one. You can leave and live a normal life afterwards um, and do your studies or have a part-time job. You know, now it's even more challenging, especially with the decimation, 
decimation of the hospitality industry. You know, if you're working in a hotel, you're working in a restaurant, in a bake shop, you know, I don't know. I don't know. You know, my partner is working in hospitality and special events. Um, he was doing high, and I say extremely high end events of like half a million dollar events with people of three to 500 people at an event. What do you do with 10 people? That's not a party. That's, that's a real kick in the pants, both for the clients as well as, you know, the people that would be doing those four or 500 events, you know, from a staffing, from a food and beverage and all those other ancillary services that you get together to make that event happen, you know, balloons, decor, sound and lighting and tenting and linens, you know, where are all those people? What are they doing? So it is challenging. So I think that's one of the nice things that I didn't mention is, you know, the program runs Monday to Friday, eight to one, two classes a day. And this is it. That's 25 hours of contact time that we're doing delivery in there. So it's a real good run for your buck. Okay. Nathan. Awesome. So we have a couple of questions in the chat here. Um, the first one's from Miriam. Um, she says, if I take this program to try to get an internship, would my courses in GPA from this program count for getting into the internship for someone who's already completed the nutrition and food program at Ryerson? So I believe she's asking if her GPA and courses from Ryerson, would that, um, how would that affect her chances of getting an internship at George Brown College's chef school, I believe. Okay, so yes, you can do a transfer credit. Uh, for your physiology or clinical nutrition. And there's another course on uh, nutrition analysis, which is basically uh, nutrition through the life cycle. I think it's what you guys call it at Ryerson. And you can get transfer credit and we'll just do a transfer and then that's it. Or if you want to really bump up your GPA and do your basic physiology, you come out with a B at Ryerson, you come out with an A plus at George Brown. Um, again, you know, if you've gotten the transfer credit, then you know what you did at Ryerson is equivalent to what you're gonna be getting at George Brown. I think, Miriam, where I think it really is beneficial is on the flip side of it, where a student comes from George Brown, um, in Pinar's case, I'll use Pinar's case because I have a, a one student or two students three years ago both came from culinary management nutrition, did the program with me and went off to Brescia. Both of them went to Brescia the same year. When they apply to Brescia, Brescia's arrangements or affiliation agreement with us is that they will evaluate it case by case. It's not just simply, okay, you did physiology here, you're gonna get the, the transfer credit at Brescia. One student was a C student who got only two transfer credits and the other student was an A or A plus student, got 11 transfer credits. So again, there's definite benefits. So if you see the value of what you've done as Pinar is from culinary management, you do really well in the food and nutrition. And then if you want to go and do the a degree program or a master's in science, then you know that's gonna be your real benefit. I think Miriam, where you're coming from, um, you need to decide what you're going to put forward for that applying of that internship. And that's going to be, a, again, it's a case by case scenario. Um, I do know that students that are applying for their internships, they're looking at those A's and A pluses to get those internships. So it's a real fight to get in, into those internships. I'm not, I won't play around with it because I, both my dietitians I work with, um, the dietitian I have right now, my PhD, she had a master's in, a, in a master's in administration. She then did, hated that, went and did her dietetics, master's of science, and did her PhD out of uh, Children's Hospital in Hamilton. Um, brilliant woman, and you know she fought for everything all the way through. She said her applying for her internship had to be her most struggling time next to uh, defending her thesis. So that, you know, I hope that helps to answer that, Miriam. Um, but usually that's based on an individual and what your marks are going forward. And I would hope that, you know, all of you that are on here with us today, 
that you know you do well and you apply yourselves and manage your time to do well in your programs because you know this is one program and one career path you need to have those good marks they're not going to take somebody with the c's um that's just cut and dry it's like saying to you do you want a surgeon that barely passed his boards and barely passed his, his three or five years of university or do you want somebody that you know got a master's got an honors and is doing extremely well and has a reputation behind them so again you know we check you know who our physicians are so like i mean from my father's perspective you know who was his surgeon for his cardiac surgeon and where was he located um i'm not going to go to this hospital because they're a bunch of quacks i'm going to go to this hospital because they have a cardiac unit it's known throughout ontario and it's one of those regional centers in ontario that has an outstanding reputation so again miriam i I really don't think it answers what you want me to say, but I think that's the best answer I can give for you. You're welcome, Miriam. So now we had another question from uh, Helen. Uh, she says, Lloyd, about the placements, are most opportunities on health facilities or do we get opportunities on other food industries such as food factories? So, between the two externships, I will always, always push you to do one of them in long-term care. It's humbling, but also on the flip side is that there is technology or there's systems or processes in place that you're not going to get in a hospital or residential care. And where I'm taking that path is, you know, if you understand what RIMDS and the clinical charting using, um, you know, the, the nutrition software, but not only nutrition, but um, I want to see, say Seaboard, it's not Seaboard, but it's the clinical charting where, you know, you do the assessments of the residents every quarter, you have care conferences with the disciplines, you know, with the doctors, the physician or the physicians, the OT, the PT, the dietetics, um, building services with the family once a year and then quarterly as, as required. And you submit all this information to the ministry. So when the ministry walks into a facility to do an inspection, then they know exactly how many residents are on puree, what room number that they're in, what are their complications, how many people are on supplements, who's on supplements. And that whole RIMDS uh, data set um, is critical to know how it is. So it's somewhere down the path in, in three to five years, you know, you're out in the industry and, and you know you're applying for a job and you want to say hey i'm going to do long-term care it's close to home you know it's better hours better pay and you get asked the question um lloyd can you explain why mds and care conferencing and assessments to me and if you can't or they give you a case file in front of you to assess are you able to assess that case file and do the coding on that and that's where you know we've had past graduates uh, come back to us and, and eat humble pie, so to say, and say, Lloyd, I know you told us that we should, and I didn't, now what do I do? So I'll work with them to find a volunteer position for a year, year and a half, and one person up in the York region area did that because she was driving an hour and 15 minutes one way to work twice a day. And, you know, looking after childcare, she had, they had one child and it was challenging. They were thinking of having a second one, but as she said, you know, how am I going to manage, you know, this and everything else? So she did a year and a half in this facility. Uh, the manager shortly after she left her, her volunteer placement and working with a dietitian every week, every other weekend for a year and a half, she applied for the position and got that full-time job. And, it goes right down to, you know, she worked well with the dietitian, but she got to know how to work the Rye MDS. And that was the, the biggest thing that she was missing. She could do the ordering, she could do the staffing, she could, you know, do the menu planning and all those other things. But when it came to the clinical aspect, that's what she was missing. So Helen, we do one clinical, which is could be in a hospital or long-term care. And that's in the clinical, though. So those are the two criteria in there. When we do your administrative, we open it up that you can do it anywhere 
that you either have a food nutrition manager, a CSM member, or a dietitian that will sign off on your externship documents for CSM. So yes, it could be food factories. We have people that have gone to, excuse me, President's Choice, that have gone to the Walmart test kitchens, that have gone to, um, in Brampton, that does uh, not the tray puree, but, oh, what is it called? Mars, it was Marzan Foods, it's now, shoot, I forget it. I have two, two past students that are working in that organization. One is a technologist and the other one is working in marketing. So again, you know, your career path, where do you wanna go with it? We have graduates that are vice presidents of companies that we have uh, a graduate that's chief operating officer of a luxury retirement home organization in Ontario. We have people that have gone into sales, into marketing. Um, two, re, two graduates of three to eight years ago have just been hired on by Cisco Canada to work in their software division for meal suites and the clinical end of things. Um, so it's nice to know, you know, the George Brown students are getting some of those nice jobs or, you know, they're excelling in their own chosen path, so to say, for their careers. So yeah, all of your, uh, your externships, unlike the rest of the pr uh, programs at, at the college, um, are arranged directly with myself. So I use my networking, I use my contacts, and we get you the placements that are, are gonna be the most critical and the most beneficial to you at the end of the day. Where are you gonna get those jobs? And I usually say that your first externship in February, March is usually your first connection to your first job. And students say, yeah, what, what do they know? What, what would they happen? But then March, April rolls around and they're getting offers or there's positions and, and you know, they'll send me a job posting. I'll send it out to current students and past students and say, take a look at the job posting if you wanna apply for it, then apply for it. You know, and it's cheap for, you know, municipalities. Right now there's a posting for two positions in the region of Peel. And, you know, I know the, person in the dietitian there, which was my past dietitian, she's working in senior management there. And she said, Lloyd, would you post this or circulate? I said, sure, circulate it. I got three past students that are going into final interviews over the next uh, Monday and Tuesday. So again, I hope that help, helps you, Helen. Um, yeah, there's opportunities. And I think you guys coming with a master's or your degree put you in a better position for those positions more in technologist or technicians in the food factories, whether it's, you know, research and development, whether it's quality assurance, um, you guys have that step above that, you know, somebody coming from a, just a culinary management perspective wouldn't have those opportunities that you will open up for you. Okay. Awesome. Uh, before we continue with questions. Um, if you, those who can hear me right now, if you can message me privately in a chat to notify me if you would like to see more um, events like these in the future with um, different programs from different colleges and universities, then that'd be helpful for Rhea on behalf of Rhea to uh, plan such events for you guys. Um, so that's just a little note there. Um, if anyone has any, any questions, um, any more questions, you can either raise your hand to so I can unmute your mic or you can message the chat and I can ask the question for you. I believe Pinar has another question. So you can uh, go ahead, Pinar, and unmute your mic. Yeah. Yes, I have another question. I was wondering, the, I think there's an enter exam for a to be accepted program. So could you explain the content of the exam? To CSNM? Uh, no, to be accepted uh, for the nutrition program. So part of the process is, you know, when you apply to the college, um, your application will be sent into our registrar for our division. 
they will do first screening and then transfer the data or transfer your name over to a divisional select list. So what we have done since the conception of the program is we've interviewed every single student. We want to make sure that, you know, is this the career path that you want? It also gives an opportunity to talk to the individuals to allow them to ask questions. Um, very similar to what I did here today, Pinar. It's about an hour to an hour and 15 minutes. I go through, you know, my first question always is going to be, so where do you want to be in three to five years in your career path? Because, you know, if you say the next year you're going to be in education or two years, uh, if you're doing a little bit longer, but then where do you want to be? Have you thought about where your focus is that you want to be in three to five years? You know, students coming out of Ryerson, you know, their career path is to become a, a dietitian. I think that's the number one path that they entered in and wanted to get out of that. And as, as like anything, we, we come up to some headways or some realities that stop us in our path and say, this is a lot of work. Do I want to continue as a dietitian? Maybe I want to continue as a food and nutrition manager. Maybe I want to continue and go into food, food, uh, food sciences and more uh, the production and the technology. So whether it's with President's Choice or it's Walmart. Walmart just has just done leaps and bounds and put is putting Loblaws in a state of, you know, a really good competition, you know, both from, you know, product development, but also from a marketing and distribution. So, you know, you have the Amazons and you have the Googles and you have the Walmarts in the states that are really fighting for what they want in there. But that interview process, um, we used to, I used to do it on a one-to-one -one in the college. And, and in March, we had to pivot really fast because in that week that we went into lockdown, I had four interviews in the office and I had to say, I'm sorry, but let's move it to Teams. And that's, you know, Ryerson's using Zoom. We use Teams as Microsoft Office Systems. And I'll tell you right now that interview process, um, out of say every 10 interviews I do, probably that translates into two or three students enrolling in the program. So the interview process is close to about 200 to 250 interviews a year that I do. Um, they used to start somewhere around end of January, beginning of February. This year, I was actually starting them on the first week of September for September 2021. But it's a way for me to communicate to the applicant um, what the program is, where your career path could go, uh, to help determine, you know, if you're missing an accounting or missing a marketing or you have, you know, a, uh, a clinical nutrition and a physiology, then we can, I talked to you about transfer credits and what that process is. So it's just a way to open up that discussion and to make that transition into the program a smooth one. So, you know, do we coddle our students or prospective students to a certain degree, but they still need to perform and do the assignments and do them exceptionally well. One of the things that I will say in the interview is, you know, we'll set the bar extremely high for what you need. And I'll use an example around menu planning. So in menu planning, you know, you're planning a menu for 21, 28 days and, and you have to provide a juice every day for breakfast. Um, we still do that. It's not recommended by Canada's Food Guide, but we still do it because, you know, those residents in those homes still expect to have a juice every morning. So you take that juice away, you're gonna have a mini revolt. But when you're planning that, you know, properly, you're very specific on what, you, what juice you're going to serve on the Monday or on the Tuesday or on the Wednesday or the Thursday. Some organizations will simply say assorted juices. And you do that for 28 days. If your ministry compliance advisor comes along and says, Pinar, unacceptable, assorted desserts. What's assorted desserts? I, in some facilities, I can tell you what sort of desserts are going to be. It's probably going to be some type of a Vortman uh, soft date or soft cherry or soft apple turnover. Um, could be ice cream and it could be whatever canned fruit that they decide to open up that day. Now, are you going to have apricots for four days in a row? If I have it just once, I'm okay. Having it twice, 
not going to happen. Having it four days or offered to me four days in a row, not going to happen. So when we do the menu planning systems and, and that with you, I'm extremely specific in saying, I want this. When you get out into the industry, if you want to lower your levels or lower your standards, then you can do so. But knowing that if a compliance advisor comes into you today and says, Pinar, I want specific juices every single day, you should be able to then go within a matter of moments, go into the system, assign specific juices, reprint it, present it to the compliance advisor within an hour, and they're going to go, you're good. You're really good because you know how to do it. And then the question comes back from the compliance advisor, why do you just use a sort of juice? And if you say it's because it's easier, yeah, it's easier, but how do you know what your costing is? How do you know what your nutritionals are? How are you uh, ensuring residents' likes and dislikes and things of that nature? So yeah, we do a, a one-on-one -on -one interview. Um, we're doing it through the teams right now. So that's the one criteria. And it, you know, I would say, you know, through the interview, some of the students, prospective students will say, no, this isn't what I want. So I'm not going to process the uh, um, approval process and I will do not approved. And then, but once you do get the approval, then the registrar will go back to their process and release the letter of offer and go through that letter of offer process with you. So it's, it's different than what you did for culinary management or culinary management nutrition. But we're one of the last programs that interviews all the students to ensure it's a good, strong program and strong call applicants into the program. Okay. Awesome. Um, so before we wrap up, I think we have about seven, eight minutes. Um, if there's any last minute questions, now would be the time to ask those. Um, so I'll just give a moment for that. And once again, in the meantime, if you would like to see um, Maria host future events similar to this for different programs um, from different universities or colleges, either message me privately or if you don't mind messaging the whole chat as well, you can do that. Um, that'd be pretty helpful to us. Good. Good, so it doesn't seem like there's any more questions, but uh, it's been a great event overall. Um, a lot of information. I've, at least personally, I've learned a lot of information. Um, that'll be helpful for me going forward with my um, career path. Because uh, personally, for me, I am primarily looking to go down the dietic, dietitian route. Um, but of course, I'm leaving my options open for any other opportunity that comes because you don't know what's going to, what the future holds in <laughs> terms of uh, job opportunities, availabilities, and all that. So it's definitely been helpful um, to learn. Um, the opportunities that are available at George Brown College, um, especially being recognized as one of the top um, programs in terms of the chef school in, um, in North America. Good. Thank you very much for having me this evening, Nathan and Rhea. It's uh, been an opportunity to, you know, showcase George Brown's program, but also to, you know, give you guys an opportunity to see what's out there and, you know, whether it's George Brown or if you want to, do another program that is approved by uh, CSNM. You can always go to the CSNM website at csnm.ca and check out the website for other accredited programs. Maybe George Brown is the one, maybe it isn't. Um, but there is the other program. Um, again, this isn't George Brown, but I do support this, the all programs across Canada. But the one that you may want to take a look at is the one out of CHA out of Ottawa as an online program, a fully online program with, um, no specific intake period. So if you want to start in January, you can start in January, start in July, you can start in July. The only criterion there is you have to finish off uh, five or six modules within 18 months, but then you also need to find your own externships to get that final criteria done. So again, we're one option. We've been around the longest. Uh, CHA has been around for years too, uh, almost as long as George Brown. So, you know, the options are there for you. So take advantage of the education. Um, I'm just saying that, you know, this may be a stopgap for you to get a job and then find some, uh, somebody to support you on your fulfilling of your externship and becoming that RD that you so desire that, that you want as your career path. Awesome. 
Um, yeah, I'll take the, top, the opportunity now to say thank you, Lloyd, for taking time out of your schedule to meet with us. Um, it was a great opportunity to learn uh, from you and learn about the opportunities um, from George Brown College. And of course, I want to say thank you to the students who decided to join this event after a long day of classes online through Zoom. I know it's uh, a struggle sometimes to want to be on, on the computer for a full day, but I thank you for taking the time as well to attend this event and um, allow it to be a success. You're welcome. All the best, guys. Thank you. Stay safe, stay sane. Yeah, you as well. Take care. Okay. Bye.